Welcome to Thrive. It's great to have you here today. We are in the book of Acts. And historical reality we've shared is the fact that you can look, every historian realizes the early church, the first three centuries, just grew explosively across the Roman world. And it doesn't make a lot of sense why, because um, everything was really set against Christianity ever growing, ever getting anywhere. Um, and so um, the message of Jesus sounded dangerous. It sounded impossible, outrageous. Um, if we think our culture in our day has kind of this antipathy towards religion or the gospel or Christianity, that first century, um, we're going to find it out again in this text, is the, it's there all over the place. But the church still responded. The church had a message. And the church loved deeply. The church served emphatically. The church lived radically lives that were so shaped by the gospel that somehow it transformed the whole society. Today, we are seeing that in, the, in three different case studies, uh, you could say, of three different types of people that the gospel impacted in Acts chapter 16. It's actually the first church on the European continent in the city of Philippi, okay? So we're reading Acts 16, it's a long verse, and by the way, you can look all this stuff up online. I think we've got it in the, oh, it's not up online. Yeah, you know what happened? I forgot to publish it. I apologize. Yeah, well, it might not, uh, just, just don't. <laughs> I might not have quite finished it this week for some reason. So, I th what, you published it? Okay, it's published. You'll see what you've got there. Can't remember if I finished it now. I finished the sermon, I just don't know if I did that online. Okay, here we go, Acts 16. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us Romans to accept our practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. As they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them 
the, the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire house that they had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, Hey, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to him, them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Wow, what a story. Um, You've probably heard it before. If you were in Sunday school as a child, I remember numerous stories about Paul and Silas in prison. In fact, I have a brother, Paul, and guess he named his son Silas. So it's Paul and Silas, and it's from this story that he took it from. But really, Paul and Silas are not kind of the center of this text. What's amazing is the three different individuals that the gospel comes to in different ways. And I think um, this text shows us that the gospel comes in different ways to different people at different times, and yet in an impactful way all around, no matter what. And so we're going to look at these three case studies and see what impact they have for us. First of all is Lydia, the gospel for the religious person. She was a God-fearer. Then secondly, the slave girl, who's gospel for the oppressed. And then finally, the jailer, who's really a, the gospel that comes to the indifferent. And we'll look at that. The gospel for the religious. This is what the text says about Lydia. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Now, there's a number of things you can get from just this verse. Um, Paul typically, though, goes to the synagogue when he came into any town. And in Philippi, it says, instead, they went to the riverside on the Sabbath. That probably means there weren't enough men. You needed 10 for a minion to form a synagogue. And so he thought, let's go to the riverside because there might be some God-fearing people who gather together for prayer. And that's exactly what he found in Lydia. It says that she worshiped God, which meant that she was a monotheist, believed in one God in a culture like Philippi in Greece that was polytheistic, believing in many gods. So some people would say, well, she's kind of halfway there. Or all the way there? Not necessarily, according to this text. She was a worshiper of God, it says. So she had a deep understanding, at least of some idea, of the God of creation and a God that would uh, rule the world. She's probably from the Middle East, because she's from Thyatira in Asia Minor, Turkey today. And she was middle class or maybe even upper class because she was a seller of purple goods. That was a hot commodity, a luxury item. She might have been in the fashion industry. Pretty solid individual. And she has a house she invites Paul and Silas to stay at, so a pretty big compound in those days. So how does the gospel come to somebody who's religious? And we see it's through a spoken word expounding the scriptures. It says this in Acts 16, 14b, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And that word for being, the speaking or saying is laleo. It's the word where we in English get the word language. So they had a dialogue. They conversed. He shared the scriptures, and she came to faith. Now, notice what was saying as well. She listened to God, and God, it said, opened her heart to hear the message. Okay? Religion is the opposite of the gospel in many ways. 
religion says, you got to first get your act together. Okay, Kathy, you hear that? Get your act together. Get things straightened out inside. Then God may listen to you. God may pay attention to you if you get your act together. The gospel says the opposite. The gospel comes from the outside in. The gospel comes to people who might not even be ready. The Holy Spirit opens your heart. It's a gift that you receive. It's not something that you can do on your own. It's not a self-help movement. It's not a, okay, I'll do my part, and then God does his part. It's the fact that here Paul shares the gospel of who Jesus is with Lydia. And now you might say, wait a minute, but she already believed in God. Yeah, but what kind of a God did she believe in? What kind of a God do people believe in today? Oh, I believe in 90-some percent of Americans believe in God, but what kind of a God do they believe in? Drill down a little. Ask questions about that God. For Lydia, it seems like she probably had a God of what I would say laws, rules, and regulations. That is, the fact that God created the world. She knew there was a moral code. She should live by that code. If she lived by that code, things were good. And then she gets rewarded for that. But what happens when you break it? That's the problem because we all break it. Okay? I don't even keep the speeding laws let alone other really important ones. I'm not saying that speeding is, you know, being safe on the highways is important. But do you understand what I mean? Let alone the words that come out of my mouth, let alone the thoughts in my head, let alone the actions or the inactions of my life. So if you believe in a God of law, this is what's great is she had a belief in a God of law and now a law maker and Paul showed her a belief in the law fulfiller, Jesus Christ, who came and fulfilled the law in her place, who did what she could not do. And she received it gladly as a gift from God himself. There are a lot of people who are religious today. Maybe spiritual, they say, not religious. Do you know they need the gospel to free them as much as everyone else? They need to be freed from their techniques and from their uh, do-gooderness, you know, trying to make up. They need to be freed from the burden that they cannot bear. And they may need to be freed from the illusion that they could possibly make it on their own or with just a little help. So the gospel comes to even a religious person and makes a difference like Lydia. You know, in one sense, sometimes religious people are more uh, resistant to the gospel. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. I, and I've shared this story before. When I was in seminary, I met a, a, a young man. I was young at the time, too, by the way, um, about my age, who was, uh, came into the seminary, into the library, and was looking up uh, the religious significance of flowers. I don't know why. He was really religious. He had gone on pilgrimages. He had spent time at monasteries. He had gone and um, dabbled in every religion to kind of cobble together one thing. And he was so resistant when I shared the gospel with him. He invited me over. I, a friend of mine went over to his house. And I shared with him the fact that everything that we have done is not, you know, it's just, it's not worth anything. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 3, how all the things that I thought were gain are considered loss for the sake of Christ. And the word he actually uses there is scubalon, and which means manure. You know, that's what I add up. My, my life looks like a, mm, yeah. And he looks at me and says, are you telling me the last 20 years of my life that I've spent doing all of this stuff is just a bunch, a crock of, and he used a different word for it. And I'm kind of looking at him going like, well, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Lydia realized she couldn't do it. Lydia heard not good advice from Paul, but good news. Somebody did it for her, and it changed her life forever. So that's the gospel for the religious. Now we see gospel for the oppressed. And this is a slave girl. 
She remains unnamed in this story. She seems in some ways almost the opposite of Lydia. Do you under, I mean, this is fascinating how Luke puts these together. Here she is unnamed. She is oppressed. She, is, she, she was trafficked. You understand? She was used by people who owned her. And she was, yes, oppressed by a demon, but she's also oppressed by other men in her life that were using and abusing her against her own will. And she comes into the story by hounding and following along. And I know it sounds like she's speaking truth. These men are following God and all this stuff. But she was basically taunting them along the way. She was so opposed. She was so twisted. She was so turned in on herself. Even though she was speaking truth, she couldn't accept that truth in any way. So how does the gospel come to somebody who's facing oppression in life? And it comes with a powerful word of freedom. A powerful word of intervention into someone's life. We see that God's word is not information. So many of us think, well, I just learned these facts and figures and therefore, boom. God's word is actually performative. It accomplishes what it does again and again. When God speaks, let there be light, there is light. And when Paul speaks God's word by his authority saying, in the name of Jesus, I tell you, come out of her, that demon has to listen. It's an intervention. And it wasn't just an intervention of a demonic uh, oppression. It was also an intervention, like I said, about an oppression from other human beings who were using her condition to make money off of her. Now, um, if you've ever known anyone who's been a, a counselor to those in addictions, and we have somebody here who does this for a living, and thank God for your gifts, John, to do this, you know, I think, John, I didn't talk to you about this beforehand, but you know that when someone, when there is an intervention in somebody's life through whatever is oppressing them and they're dealing with it and there is some freedom, not everybody is happy about it in the family system because they're used to the status quo. And they might even fight against it, right? As crazy as that might sound. Because everybody's gotten so used to this person in that oppression. And here we see in this situation the blowback, the pushback that, John, uh, that Paul and Silas had was so fierce that these men riled up a crowd, riled up the magistrates, got them beaten, whipped, and thrown into prison for what they had done in freeing this woman, not simply from demonic possession, although that's profound. It wasn't just individualistic, it was systemic, a huge systemic change. She was now freed from being used by others. How important that is. When you share the gospel with the oppressed, you don't share a pamphlet or a tract or a little lecture. <laughs> you speak truth in such a way that it is an intervention. And it comes across very powerfully. And it is about deliverance. And it's spoken with the authority of what Jesus has done on the cross for that person to free them. And any church that's going to be about truly um, the gospel is not going to just look at individuals and say, well, we just need to have you like forgiven of your little individual sins. It looks at the whole system and realizes the status quo has to change for some individuals. It's not just one individual. It's the whole system that is fighting against. And boy, man, you are going to upset some people when those things happen. There's a cost that Paul and Silas paid for upsetting the system. They get treated like Jesus was. And they rejoice in that. Fascinating, isn't it? That's the gospel for the oppressed. Finally, there's the gospel for the indifferent, and this is the jailer. He's likely a Roman soldier. 
probably semi-retired from the military and now given kind of a posh job to just kind of do what he, I mean, you saw he's sleeping on the job <laughs> in this text. I mean, it's not, it's not, you throw him in jail, what's going to happen, right? You don't care about the prisoners and their welfare at all. In fact, he just see, he just does what he's told. He looks at Paul and Silas. They've been beaten bloody. They probably dealt with, I mean, their life could have been threatened by just the beating that they received with rods. And then he's told by the magistrates, throw him in jail. He throws him in jail, and he even puts him in the stocks. It isn't until after his conversion that he comes and he washes their wounds. He doesn't care about them. He only sees them as objects. He's that indifferent, that jaded. He's doing his job. He's probably middle class. He's enjoying just, I just do what I'm told. So how does the gospel come to someone who seems pretty indifferent to both human suffering and plight around him, to the system itself, and just to religion in general? He shakes things up. Literally, God shakes things up. It's called, you know, an earthquake. For others, he shakes them up in one form or another. This happened actually to a man named Aban Usman, a Kenyan, who grew up Muslim and in fact was uh, part of a family where he was one of the um, proclaimers or callers to um, prayer five times a day from his mosque on the co coast of Kenya. And one day God shook him up. He went to try to pray. This is in Christianity Today. And in 2009, when he went to try to pray, he couldn't even get a word out of his mouth. Something had happened. And he goes like, he was just taken back. He couldn't figure it out. He went home. He tried to figure out what was going on. He talked to a friend. He went back to do it again. And this time, he couldn't get a word out of his mouth. He was so troubled by the events in his life, he went out into the street and started to walk around. And he so happened to be walking by a Christian missionary at the time. This is what he shares. He says, during my walk, I came to a marketplace where a large crowd had gathered around the back of a pickup truck. Getting close enough to hear and see what was going on, I listened. As a Christian missionary was preaching, he was clearly a Kenyan just like me and not someone who had come here from the Western world. I was skeptical and kept my distance, but I listened to what he was saying. After that man had finished preaching, I felt compelled to approach him. Because I was known very well in that area, the pastors who were with them, they were also Kenyan, initially blocked me from coming forward. But the missionary allowed me to talk with him. He shared the gospel with me. And right then and there, everything felt different. I saw everything that had happened during that day in a new light. I knew God was the one who wouldn't let my voice come out. God is the one who causes this earthquake and shakes up this Roman jailer enough to where he despairs over his own life. And he started getting shook and, uh, shaken up, shooken up, shaken up <laughs> earlier, which is fascinating. Can you imagine? And how do you, how do you bring the gospel to someone who is indifferent? And we've got a lot of people like this in our society. Through a shocking, um, earth-shaking show and display of God's grace. It starts right away with something totally unexpected. When Silas and Paul are thrown into the prison, how are they responding? Do you see in the text? At midnight, they're in the middle of the prison. Everybody's listening to them. What are they doing? Singing and praising God. You can imagine the Roman jailer going like, what is with these people? Who are they? Something that shook him to the core, because that's not the way you respond to the physical violence and the physical torture that these men went through. He was shaking him up then. And then he shook him to his core. When the jail rocked, and the doors were opened, and the shackles came off, do you know why he was ready to take his own life? He had placed all his honor and his status and his identity in being a good Roman soldier and being able to do his job well. And he knew that if a prisoner escapes in those days, guess who pays the price? The jailer. He'd lose his life. So in one last 
desperate attempt at some control, he said, I'm going to take my own life rather than face the humiliation and the shame of being castigated by the Romans and other magistrates be in, with a public execution. And when God had shaken him to the core of his being so that he didn't have that identity anymore of his own status, that's when Paul stops him and says, no, we're all here. And what's the most shocking thing in the story was not the earthquake. and It wasn't even them singing. It's the fact that when Paul and Silas and the other prisoners had the opportunity to escape, and you realize for Paul and Silas, it was illegal what had happened to them under Roman law. They had no reason to be in there. They should not have endured any of that. They could have left that jail and said, God just freed us. But they would not gain their own freedom at the expense of someone's life. That's the gospel. And why wouldn't Paul and Silas do that? Because someone already had given up his life for their freedom. Jesus. All they were doing was responding like he did. They would not leave that jail. They would not take care of themselves first. They were showing love to that jailer by staying put. And when that Roman jailer realized this, notice he comes to Paul and Silas, breaks down and says, what can I do to be saved? And that night his whole family, his whole household are baptized. Everyone comes to faith. I don't know if you've been watching the video series. I'd recommend it, um, The Chosen. It's, uh, you can download it for free. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on a number of, uh, we're in only season two. Um, it's the life of Jesus and his calling of the disciples. And what you notice in this story is they weave a lot of things together in ways that doesn't defy the biblical order of things in the Gospels. It kind of accentuates different facts, but you find out that there is no, quote, type that Jesus calls. You've got, you know, uh, Peter, who's kind of the can-do-it a willful person, but you also have Matthew, who's the calculator and trying to figure everything out and make sense in his head. You've got Simon, who's a zealot who wants to take on by force the world. You've got um, John and James, who basically are very vindictive and want to kind of cast down judgment on others. You find out you've got Mary Magdalene, who was oppressed by demons. You've got Thomas, who is skeptical of everything. And Jesus intervenes in each of their lives in unique ways to call them individually. And here in this story, it's the same thing. If you're wondering in this message, well, you know, there are those who do the church thing, and there are those who go, you know, they're religious or they're spirit. I'm just not that kind of type. You're going to have to, uh, this story says, sorry, there's no such thing as a religious type. In fact, the religious type might need to be convert it needs to be converted along with every other type. Isn't that fascinating? So the question is for you personally, what does it take or what did it take or what will it take to get you to receive the gospel? Are you the religious type that still relies on yourself? Still playing by the rules, not realizing you've got not a rule maker? simply, but you've got a rule fulfiller, law keeper, that keeps it for you in your place and is your substitute in Jesus. Are you the type that um, is dealing with oppression in one form or another, that you're stuck either in a system where people are using, or people are still trafficked today, by the way. I don't know if you realize that. Um, or are you dealing with the fact that you're oppressed because you are now under the control of an addiction of some form or another? You probably need an intervention. Or are you the kind of the, well, you know, I came to church today because so-and-so dragged me here. You know, it's usually Mother's Day or Christmas or Easter, I know. But there's no religious type. God is calling you. He might be shaking you up. 
That also means, by the way, for those who are followers of Jesus, maybe you got here because you were kind of that religious conscientious type and then you realized you couldn't do it and the, the gospel came. It's like, wow, thank you, Jesus. Or maybe you faced the, uh, an intervention in your life or maybe you have faced that you were indifferent and God shook up things in your life and you came. But um, don't expect everybody else to be the same as you. But also, don't write anyone off. I know we've got members here who prayed for decades for their children to come to faith again in Jesus, who struggled with addictions or who struggled with depression or who dealt with this or went wayward in this way or that way, rebellious, and Jesus in the end brought them. Don't give up on your neighbors who seem so indifferent to the gospel, that seem so satisfied. I don't know if you want to really pray that God shakes up their lives. I mean, <laughs> well, maybe you do want to pray because it's more important to have a, a big shakeup in life to wake them to the reality of what they really need. Or you know the religious type who are doing all the right things, but they're doing it with still a sense of they've got to do it and they're still under the law. Just recognize everybody needs Jesus. And that Jesus is the one who comes to each person, who is the one who, who uh, spent time with a religious like Nicodemus and discussed and dialogued to bring him to an understanding of what it means to be born again, who ate with sinners and tax collectors, who, who intervened in the lives of people who were oppressed time and again, and who paid the price much higher than Paul ever paid or Silas ever paid with a little night in jail or a, a beating here or there, who was who was beaten and bruised and rejected and crucified, but who also then went through hell itself and paid the price of every sin upon his back. Every sin. Even Jesus died according to what we know in the New Testament, the claim in the New Testament is Jesus didn't die for the sins of some good people who might believe someday. He didn't die for most people or some or all people in certain circumstances. He died for every sin that has ever happened, every rebellious act, every terrible thought, every evil intent, every genocide, every torturous thing that has ever happened in this world, every defiant event and prideful um, moment. This world is at, all at one time in one place, and it felt like an eternity. He was going through hell itself so that there is no one that can say, well, you know, I'm probably not the type Jesus wants. No, you are. He wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Period. So you can't find a loophole today. You can't find a way of saying, well, maybe not. It's for you. It's for me. And it's for everyone in our community. And that's how the church grew explosively when they understood there isn't a type there isn't a class, there isn't a race, there isn't a nationality, there isn't a language, there isn't a people group, there isn't somebody closer and somebody farther. Jesus comes for everyone. Whether they're religious, they're oppressed, or they're indifferent. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for bringing everyone here today, some for the first time. Some for the hundredth, <laughs> Lord. Thank you for the fellowship you've given us. Thank you, Lord, that we have shown that there is no type here that thrive over the years. College students, young adults, children, older adults, um, religious, irreligious, um, people who have faced everything. <laughs> you know our condition, and you bring us all together, and by grace we are united, and we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. You came for each one of us. You've spoken to us personally. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. We, uh, we pray specifically today for a number of individuals and situations. We pray for Brooke as she is mourning the loss of her grandmother and is there right now um, in, I think it's North Carolina. We pray, Lord, for Hunter as he is by his grandmother's side who um, is... 
uh, not doing well and may not be with us long, but she's going to be with you, and we thank you for that. We lift up to you, Lord, Chris Rodriguez, who's hospitalized now for over a week, and is, we just pray, Lord, that you bring your healing there and to be with Jamie and Hillary and the family, Lord, as they care for Chris and for the doctors, and that you, you open up a way where the doors seem closed right now, but you, O oh Lord, are in present in this situation and help us learn to walk alongside of Jamie and Hillary and Chris right now. We lift up, O oh Lord, to you um, our campus ministry as uh, freshmen are starting to, uh, to, um, to go through orientation this week. We just pray that you bless us with great connections to students, some who may be indifferent, some who are religious, but all who need you, Lord Jesus. We lift up to you, O Lord, um, the coming weeks when we gather together um, in a variety of ways. We thank you, Lord, that we're at the point now in the pandemic where we can be more open. And we pray, Lord, that we have learned good lessons of how to love and to serve in this time so that we can move forward. I pray, Lord, that you would really move in the hearts of our members and friends to come together to share our stories of your grace in our lives in a variety of ways, and that you use that for your kingdom's sake. We pray, O oh Lord, for our offering today, that we offer ourselves first to you, Lord Jesus, and then whatever our finances are for your kingdom's sake. We pray, O oh Lord, uh, for those who are online and those who are here in person, Lord, that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper in a few minutes, that you forgive us our sins, you know our condition, and that you renew us and restore us, that you create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew the right spirit within us. Lord God, um, there are many situations, people who need your healing, friends and family, people like Kai, a young child in California going through chemo treatment, and his mother, Rachel, for Christopher up in Michigan as a young adult, who also is going through treatments, Lord, for a brain tumor. We pray your intervention in all their lives as well, Lord God, as you sometimes shake us up, but we are never fully shaken to the core because our foundation is on your goodness and your grace. All this we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. And we lift it up in your name. May you be glorified here at Thrive and in every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.